Okay. Hi. So um, I guess I've been introduced by name. I'll just say a couple things about myself, and then we'll dive in. So for the last 12 years, I have been looking at human rights movements around the world and nonviolent human rights movements around the world and trying to figure out what makes them effective and what makes others ineffective. And my emphasis that whole time has been on looking at the kinds of strategies that work for movements, whether they're movements for women's rights, <coughs> democratic rights, indigenous rights, movements against corruption, uh, movements for self-determination, movements for environmental preservation, a wide range of movements. I try to look at the strategic principles uh, that make movements effective and try to then sort of deduce a set of principles or best practices that you could say could apply to movements really almost all over the world, at a local scale, at a national scale, or even at an international scale. And so for much of my time, I have looked at strategies and tactics, which is the topic of the next session that I'll co-present with Yvonne. And it's only been in the last several years that I've really realized you can't really have strategies and tactics in any kind of sustained way unless you have a movement. Or I realized that early, but I never really looked at movements so critically <laughs> as something that, that was so dynamic and interesting. And now I'm just absolutely fascinated by them. And so this session is going to just focus on, you know, Maché started to talk about how movements begin to form. I'm going to talk about how mo movements begin to unite, how they build coalitions. And then once that's done, how they actually sustain them. Because the challenges that a movement has in the beginning with forming a coalition and unity shift over time. And the stresses on a movement shift over time, and it's very difficult. In fact, I usually start this presentation by saying the following. Most people, when they look at a movement, and they're trying to figure out if it has a chance of success or not, will look at the movement's adversary and say, well, that, that government or that multinational corporation is so powerful or, you know, or vulnerable that the movement has a good chance of success. So there's a view that the biggest challenge is outside of the movement, and the movement has to face it. But what if the biggest challenge is actually internal to the movement, is uniting people and keeping them together? Over decades of sometimes deliberate divide and rule by a, a, a movement's adversary, or simply populations that don't have much social contact, don't know each other, and then suddenly have to form bonds of trust and do you know, sort of cross-cultural communication and all kinds of things to build that trust, build those networks, and then start to begin to go forward as a united front. So, and of course, it's challenging to work with other people. And who here, is, who here has worked in coalition before? Is it easy? No, it's not easy. And in fact, within, within you know, you don't usually, you know, make your press statement about how hard it is to work in coalition, but within every coalition, it's kind of like a family food fight with people holding down different roles and different perspectives and intense pressure. And then you come out and sometimes are able to form this united front, but it's challenging. So we're going to talk about that. So the first thing I want to do is to find movement. What do we mean by that? And then I want to do a little brainstorm about it's a very broad question. What do movements need to do in order to succeed? It's a broad question. Think about a movement you may have watched or been part of. Let's think of all the tasks and attributes that they may need to have and tasks that they may, may need to do in order to succeed. And I think we'll come up with a long list. Then I want to go into a theory by an um, uh, activist, an organizer, and also a scholar, a scholar practitioner named Bill Moyer, about his four roles. He sort of takes this long list of things that movements need to do and puts it into sort of four key roles, which I think is a useful theory, especially getting discussion started. And then we'll talk about coalitions. And uh, there's no way I'll get through all of this, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. Um, I'll talk about different kinds of coalitions, potential benefits and costs of forming coalitions, factors that affect how coalitions form, and factors that affect if they're sustainable or not. And this is a presentation that I, I mostly focus on theory. Um, you all have, you know, many of you have worked in coalitions, so I kind of want you to volunteer your case examples throughout and say, wait, the theory doesn't sound right. Or I love that theory. That is perfectly describes my experience and so forth. Okay.
So definitions. What's a movement? What is a movement? What are some aspects of a movement? Yeah. When different people enjoy a cause, mm -hmm. they are then uh, motivated to uh, obtain a certain objective. OK. So people join. OK, so there's the idea of an objective. What else? Gathering together. Is Pardon? Getting together. Is Getting together. OK, so being collective. Bhavana? OK. It's not just a spontaneous outburst of anger. Sure, sure. Was there another? Yeah. yeah. I think it's a group of people having the same interests and looking for the same goals. OK. So common objectives. OK. Was there another? Yeah. Cooperation. Sure. Cooperation. Yep. Yep. Georgi. Maybe they have common enemy. Uh huh. They have to be together. Okay. So they, they both they could have a positive vision of what they're for and a negative vision of what they're against. The negative vision being the common enemy. We want to stop or end that practice or opponent's rule. One other? Anything else? Share ideas. Share ideas. Sure. And you can only really share ideas if you're working with people who are different than you, who have different ideas. So this gets in this element of how diverse is a movement. Yeah. It's a process. It's a process. It's a process. Sure. And sometimes in that process, we could be looking at a movement forming right now in a country and not be quite sure that it's a movement, but only in retrospect look back and say, wow. We could sort of see something coming together at the time, but when we look back at it, we see, wow, that really sustained itself as a movement. Yeah, Prince. I think the process should be continuous. Huh? A continuous. Continuous, process. yes. Continuous, sustained. OK. Let me ask another question. And it still may apply to your hands. What's the difference between a movement and an organization? What is the difference between a movement and an organization? <laughs> like an advocacy organization. Adel. Well, I don't have a specific definition, but I believe it's, it's more related with the name movement. Like you have to be active and doing something on, on the ground, like uh, mm -hmm. organizing activities. Because all of these, uh, all of these things could be on like, we, we can be a movement, but sit here in the room and like doing research papers and things like that, but we are not a movement. Mm -hmm. I believe it's somehow we need to have to be like activities and like movement and like- Movements people. move. They yeah. move. Exactly. Not all organizations move. We could have an organization, me and Diane, we exist on paper, we have very nice flyers we like to hand you, and we are, have board meetings sometimes and make decisions. And as long as we have a budget, we, and we're, then we're an organization, but we're not moving necessarily, right? OK. Um, sorry. Yeah. One more addition here would be that this is a question we uh, debated when I was working with the government of India. Uh -huh. And we had to define the backbone capability for India. And we were very uh, conflicted about whether to define it as a movement or as an organization. And one thing we realized was that if you define it as an organization, it becomes a legal entity, mm -hmm. which means it's owned by somebody and therefore seem to be representative of the interests of that particular actor. Mm -hmm. whereas, if, whereas if it's a movement, it's co-opted by anybody who wants to be a part of it. So that was one important um, reason why we made it a movement and not an organization, mm -hmm. the, the legal aspect of And therefore the psychological uh, association aspect of being an organization versus being a movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good points, good points. I'll take two more, Razik and Georgi. <coughs> Uh, I, I think movement can be based on uh, on the principle of incapacity. You know, it provides a different sense of contrary to the status quo. So mm -hmm. Based on the principle of antithesis. The principle of which? Antithesis. Oh, antithesis. Yeah. Great. 
Great. Yeah, it's not, you know, it's not just go along with the same status quo. Right. So you have to provide a different sense of thing. I agree completely, especially when we're talking about civil resistance movements, which are practically by definition outside of this traditional sort of status quo. Absolutely. Um, actually, one, one difference could be that uh, in organization you have uh, like eight jobs there. Like you are getting something, I mean, the salary for the job you are doing, while in the movement usually, okay, they, you also can also have get uh, salary, but it's more enthusiast based. Yes. So this one. And, uh, Second thing is, uh, movement's target is always something like once you achieve, maybe this movement doesn't exist anymore. Wild organization can work on different issues, and well, today you work, you have this project, another day you have another project. If you have uh, good fundraising, then you just maybe focus on something else. While on the movement, it's a little bit narrower. Yeah. And you cannot be too broad. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And I, the, what you said also about this. This people choose to be part of it. They're not paid to be part of it is, a, is, I think, a very important point that we'll come back to. Because it's a critical part of understanding unity and also understanding strategy and tactics that Yvonne will talk about next. So here's a kind of academic definition. I took three definitions that are footnoted down there and, and um, sort of weave them together. So I mean, pretty much it's everything you said. Collect ongoing, so it has to be continuing over time, collective, lots of people, efforts, they're acting, aimed at bringing about consequential change, something big, something significant in a social, economic, or political order. Could be a movement against oppressive social practices. Could be a movement against, um, that, that doesn't even have a government or a corporation or, or a um, official entity that it's necessarily uh, trying to change. Uh, economic or political order. Movements are civilian based. This means uh, if you're talking about a large movement, large movements are driven by people who don't have special status or privilege. Elites, quote unquote elites, people with special status and, uh, status and privilege may play a role in that movement, but the driver of the movement is something much bigger than that, civilian based. Involve widespread participation, popular participation, and they alert. They put issues on the agenda. When no one's talking about it, when no one knows about it, issues, movements put it on the agenda. Educate, very critical function. One of the ways that political consciousness is built isn't by going and lecturing someone about the big problems happening nationally. It's about, it can happen when they see a local issue. There was corruption in this city, and that's why they built this giant coal plant or this giant toxic site right by my neighborhood, and it was corrupt, that decision. And that's what I know I care about. But when I get involved, I realize, my gosh, that corruption is happening everywhere, and there are that same company or government entity did this to six other communities. That's how movements can also educate, not just by telling people. Um, they serve. A word that, um, that I've heard Reverend Lawson use many times is community. And so if you look at mo a movement as a community, communities have needs that need to be served. Not just necessarily material needs, sometimes emotional or spiritual or psychological needs. When you look at people staying in movements, they, stay, they join, the research shows they join in large, in, in, uh, or a major factor is because they know people in the movement. There's a social element to it, of course, and then they stay. That's not the only reason, but it's a strong reason. And then, they, of course, they mobilize people in order to create change. OK. So some implications of this. Movements are based on voluntary commitment, right? You can't pay people. And last, last year, the first bullet point just said movements are voluntary. And um, Reverend Lawson and Mary King and some other people in the audience said, no, no, no. Voluntary is the wrong word. because you might volunteer, but pretty soon you realize you can't so easily volunteer out. <laughs> volunteer is like, hey, I just decided to show up. I heard there's a protest, right? OK, I'm going to go home. <laughs> That's not always how it works, right? You, you, there, there is a commitment. And you make that commitment, or the commitment almost gets made for you. And pretty soon you're, pardon? Or you're getting arrested. Right, right. And suddenly, <laughs> right. Or you, the commitment gets made for you, right. And so. And so that could be based on a wide variety of reasons. But it's, in a sense, it's voluntary. You're not getting paid at any given chance. You could choose to not participate. But there starts to be a momentum 
when people volunteer and, the, and, and a strength of commitment that people feel, I can't leave this. I, but I'm choosing to be part of it. There's no threat against me if I leave, but some part of me says, I cannot leave this. Okay, representative. How do you get people to come? They have to feel like there's something that, that is welcoming and represents them, right? So movements have to be very good listeners. You can't sit in a, with a group of five people in a room and say, okay, we've thought about this issue a lot, but we haven't talked to any people about it, how they feel, but let's go out and use our message and our terminology and expect them to follow. People don't feel it's representative, often diverse. When you look at movement success, if something starts as a student movement, it can achieve objectives that are within the capacity of those students. But if it's going to keep growing, it will eventually have to diversify its base. Perhaps to rural farmers, perhaps to urban laborers, perhaps to different groups. Not an organization, we've kind of established that, right? And not a spontaneous outburst. It's not a Twitter hashtag that's trending. It's not an outburst of anger or violence. Or those things sometimes can be important points in a movement forming. But the word movement, and part of why I'm so sort of listing these bullet points is because the word movement is just used all the time. NGOs use movement, corporations use movement. Everyone wants to claim that there's some movement because movement, what it really, the way it's used normally is just popular. Hey guys, we're part of a movement, we're popular. And I, I feel it's important to sort of take this term and take it back a little bit and say this is what it is and this is what it's not. <coughs> okay, so what do movements have to do in order to succeed? Think of a movement that you know or have looked at. There's gonna be probably lots of things, but what are some things I have to do? Yeah? I think the first thing a movement should, should have is, 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 is a good leader. A leader that can, that can inspire and guide. Well, so it needs a good leader, a good public leader? Yeah. Okay. Because we're also going to talk about different forms of leadership, but public leadership is one. Okay. What else? Clear goal. Clear goal or goals. And maybe some of those are long term, <coughs> maybe some are short term. Mm -hmm. Aisha. Can you be inclusive? Inclusive. If it wants to gain power, if the movement is dominated by a certain group, it will be very limit, ultimately limited by that group. Paulina. Yeah, to analyze the environment. Pardon? To analyze the environment. Oh, they have to be very good analysts. Including the adversary. And they have to be good strategists, right? Sushil. Yeah, I was saying strong commitment. Strong commitment. And commitment is one of those things. <laughs> One the of the words that we are using is to low hanging fruits. Okay, say more. Uh, movement should, uh, should focus in, um, in obtaining the quick goals, low hanging fruits. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the movement has a very, uh, the goal that can be attained in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 50 years, so that could not be <coughs> succeeded. But if there is a goal that can immediately achieve, mm -hmm. that, that makes a um, there should be some low-hanging goals. And what's the benefit of, of it when you achieve that low-hanging fruit? Because it keeps the motivation. Ah, so it keeps the commitment, it gives the motivation. It creates, we were talking earlier, why don't people rebel? And one of the reasons is they lack confidence, they lack hope that things could be different, right? They don't know what to do. And even if they did, they don't think it would make a difference. So movements usually start small and have to do something that does two things. When they achieve the small victory, it proves that they can work, which overcomes that reason that people have this lack of confidence. And people learn by watching. So they look and they say, we see how they did it. So absolutely. So commitment, short-term short victories. Yeah, Emmanuel. transparency, accountability. I'm going to put them separate because some people would say, well, we can't be too transparent if we're in a, if there's someone who will persecute us. So it's a difficult, it's a balance sometimes. Tariq. Uh, openness, networking, and uh, cooperation. Okay. Networking, cooperation. What else, Jim? 
Did, were you going to say something? He also said open measure. Right, right. Jim? Yeah, I want to say that, that most people who do not rebel do not resist. That's because we have so many structures in nations and the world generally that make people think they are impotent. Mm -hmm. That they have no power. Mm -hmm. social to their own benefits. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole development of gangs, as an example. Mm -hmm. Violence in America is a sign that people want to rebel, that they're opposed to what the status quo is, and mm -hmm. they do not know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. That's my, that's mm -hmm. my analysis mm -hmm. of my own situation. Mm. Thank you. I'll take a couple more, and then I'm going to keep going, because we're already 20 minutes in. Uh, Julia, and then... Hello. Yeah, maybe some on common values and ideas in which we can start the struggle. Shared values and ideas, yeah. And also the relation with the, their own context where they want to start the struggle. I mean, the relation with the background, the context, social context. Okay, social context. Similar social context. Great. We'll talk. We'll come back to that about coalition building, and then hello. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So ongoing evaluation of process. Mm -hmm. this, is, and this is something that people talk about with planning a lot. You come up with a great plan and then you start taking action and within 10 minutes the plan isn't quite so helpful anymore. But the planning process is very helpful and the an analytical process is helpful. We, there will be more time to comment. Um, so I made a small list and some things we didn't list, they need to be good communicators. They may need to work with media. They may need to manage a budget. They may need to, and, and, and money can be a big dividing issue in movement, so that's not a small thing. They may need to have insider access at some point. They may need a way to turn that grassroots power into legislation at some point, so they may need allies on the inside. They may, they, they may need good lawyers. They need to be good listeners, right? They need to understand their issues incredibly well but if they're going to work in coalition, they might need to understand other issues incredibly well, too, so they can draw the bridges. They can't just be only focused on their issues. They may need to be willing, people in movement may need to be willing to live on very little money. Not talked about as much, but it's a big factor. They need to understand the history of other movements. There's a lot of things they need to do. And the point is, is that because there are so many things, this is beyond the capacity of any small group of people, no matter how smart they are, to do these things. It's, it, I say it's a team sport. It's a team process. And this is why this issue of coalitions is so important, because even though a movement is bigger than just a coalition, organizations sometimes can play very important roles in doing some of these critical actions. OK. Yeah. to be patient and uh, something like movement is a smoking to, to, to listen and to be patient so but it's actually a big big thing maybe nationwide right so who, who is going to listen and who is going to evaluate on this and who is going to uh, decide what to do so what is um, maybe you are yeah. going to come to that point but what will be the communication Within the, within the movement, and what's the uh, decision-making processes? And so that is stuff that we're going to cover in the next session, and it's a great question. And I think what I'm talking about here, not all of these attributes or tasks are going to necessarily be done at the same time. Insider access may be important later on, but not in the beginning. 
Listening may be very important at the beginning and may be more difficult to do later on. It's still important, but more difficult. And so, you know, and Yvonne will talk more about this when we present. If a movement can get a model right at the beginning, by th really listening, building a culture where people understand how to resolve conflicts within themselves, uh, listen to each other, listen to the public, strategize, analyze, as Hillel was saying, when those things are built into the culture of a movement, even when the movement's small, when the movement starts replicating itself and getting bigger, they start to spread out too. Or that's, that, now we're talking theory. We can talk practice later, but that's the theory anyway. Okay. Sure. Sure. So that would be allies who are in the government or corporation or other official roles okay. that, that can sometimes communicate or press for a movement's demands. Okay. So this large list of things is too large. No movement's going to want to sit there with a list of 30 tasks and check them all off. So I like to introduce this theory by Bill Moyer. Again, um, uh, organizer and, and, and a scholar in the United States. And he sort of boiled this down to there being four roles of social activism, four functions that movements have to serve. And these are the four. Movements need people who identify as citizens, and I'll say what that means, as rebels, as change agents, and as reformers. So the citizen. So here's what Moyer writes about citizens, or part of what. Social movement activists first need to be seen by the public as responsible citizens. They must win the respect and ultimately the acceptance of the majority of ordinary citizens in order for their movement to succeed. Consequently, citizen activists need to say yes to those fundamental principles, values, and symbols of a good society that are also accepted by the general public. Well, sometimes I've presented this to grassroots activists and they say, uh, no. No, we're not doing that because the situation is so corrupt, it's really hard to think about ways that we can draw on values. Sometimes values like patriotism that have been so abused and manipulated by the ruling powers and say, we're going to now start to talk about patriotism? We're going to now start to talk about you know, symbols that the adversary is using and try to reclaim them? It seems very hard. And Moyer is saying it's necessary and there's a role for some people to do that. So the citizen uses societal symbols, values, and narratives. Think about it as a, as a symbolic vocabulary that people have in society, and they use it. Hold society to its stated values. You saw this a lot in, the, in, a, lot in a lot of movements, you know, where people will quote the Constitution or certain religious principles and reclaim them. Call people to, le to live up to them. Helps movements be perceived as legitimate, seeking public good, upholding public values. Protects movements from attempts by power holders to discredit them. What's the, easy, what's the most common way power holders try to discredit a movement? Those people are dangerous, terrorists, you know, drug use, you know, all of that. They're in other words, they're not like you, mainstream population. They're them. Do away with them. Citizens are sort of a, you know, help to go against that. Right, right. Well, sometimes they do both, you know? And then show that everyone can get involved. So I was talking, I was giving a workshop once um, to a bunch of organizers dealing with local issues around a nuclear power plant. And at the end, a woman came up to me and said, you know, I've never identified myself as an activist. And when I go to these activist sort of meetings, I always feel like I'm outside of it. Like I don't quite know the, the language and terms they're using. And, and I'm not quite comfortable. I don't feel fully accepted. I now realize it's not an activism thing, it's a people thing. Activism is not about activists. Activism, when it's successful, is about people. Very citizen kind of comment. Okay, Moyer's second type or role, the rebel. At the same time, activists must be rebels who say aloud no and protest social conditions and institutional policies and practices that violate course societal values and principles. Okay, so someone needs to call a lie a lie, right? Someone needs to disturb the peace. Someone needs to call out you know, propaganda and say, let's stop being so polite about this. This is, this is completely false. Someone needs to say, we're not talking about this really important thing. Puts the issues on the public agenda and keep them there. They force society to look at problems. In the United States, we had Occupy Wall Street. Before Occupy Wall Street, that sort of term, the 99%, which is now used a lot in US politics, 
referring to those who have, been, who have not benefited from this economic growth in this country. They put that issue on the agenda. They say no. They demonstrate sacrifice, fail acuti, demonstrate bravery, show how institutions and power holders are violating public trust. So institutions are always saying, yes, you know, we are representing the true values. Rebels reveal that's not true. And they raise the cost of maintaining the status quo. We're sitting here in this park until we get a hearing, until we're able to meet with these people and so forth. Okay. Acti then the third role, activists need to be change agents who work to educate, organize, and involve the general public to actively oppose present policies and seek positive, constructive solutions. So, okay, you've got citizens going out and trying to use the symbolic vocabulary and say it's activists are these you know, people over there, they're us. They're calling us to our highest values. They're saying that if we want to hold our highest values, we might need to do something radical sometimes, right? So that's the citizen. And the rebels are way ahead. Of, they're already doing radical stuff, right? But who's, who's organizing people at a local level? Who's doing the teach-ins? Who's doing the local committees? Who's doing the education and, and the local democratic processes? And, and Moyer calls these people change agents. Educate, organize, and serve people locally. Recruit others to become involved from diverse parts of society, build participatory democracy, promote new dialogue, localize and reinterpret issues, very important. It can be very difficult to sustain a movement if it's only talking about national issues because most people will connect to those national issues through local manifestations of those issues. If the issue is national corruption, local corruption is often a link. Okay, and they do training which is very important for keeping nonviolent discipline and building movement culture. And then finally, activists must also be reformers who work with the official political and judicial structures to incorporate solutions into new laws and the policies and practices of society's public and private institutions. Then they must work to get them accepted as the new conventional wisdom of mainstream society. So the reformers, these are often the more insiders. They convert grassroots power into sometimes formal institutional power. They negotiate, though it can be very difficult when you have a voluntary movement deciding who leads that movement. Who has the claim to negotiate can be a very difficult issue. But if you do negotiate, oftentimes you need people, some allies on the inside. They have specialized knowledge, and they help inform the movement of what's going on inside institutions. Okay, so is this, these four roles, there's conflict inherent in these four roles, right? Because the rebels are doing one thing, and the citizens are saying, no, no, you're getting way too far away from what's making these people feel comfortable. And the change agents are saying, the rebels are getting all the press coverage, or the reformers are getting all the press coverage, but we're in the communities doing the work. And the reformers look at the rebels and say, you guys are so unrealistic, you don't even know how policy really works. And the rebels look at the reformers and say, we've waited on you guys for how many years? And nothing's changing, right? People are laughing, so I guess I might be onto something. <laughs> so this is like this inherent conflict, right? So again, we have to get rid of the idea conflict is bad here, as long as it's nonviolent and constructive, right? And so this is why a lot of people who are activists will talk about sitting in meetings for 12 hours at a time to deal with stuff like this. Now, Moyer goes on, and I won't go into the rest of it, where he comes up with this eight stages of movements where you can see at different stages, different roles are needed more than others. And so at the beginning, you may not need reformers, you may need rebels, because you need attention. But if you're a mature rebel, you're gonna understand that you will need reformers later on, so maybe you don't wanna necessarily, you know, you might wanna say things a little differently. And if you're a reformer, you may realize you actually really need a grassroots base, and so on. So this is my image of these, <laughs> the kinds of meetings these different groups can get into. <laughs> and then the last thing Moyer says is that mature activists can embody multiple roles. So we have here Martin Luther King in a classic image on the March on Washington who could invoke values of the citizen, wore the suit as a way to try to 
connect or bridge social distance or overcome stereotypes at the same time that he could be a rebel, at the same time that he could sit and negotiate in the halls of power in a lot of different roles. You have here Reverend Lawson as well playing multiple roles. Here you have Jenny Williams and uh, Magadonga Malongu, who founded an organization, or not an organization, a movement in Zimbabwe called WOZA, Women of Zimbabwe Arise. And their symbol is L for love, the love of a mother, the hard love of a mother for some little child like Mugabe who's gotten completely out of line and needs some discipline, <laughs> right? So they're invoking this element of citizenship, this sort of shared value. At the same time, they're doing this amazing uh, change agent work in communities. At the same time, I, at last count, I saw Jenny a few months ago, I think she'd been arrested over 50 times. Incredibly brave, willing to be the rebel. Keep going, I'll give more examples. Another one is Lech Valenza, you know, dissident in Solidarność, uh, you know, occupies the Gdansk shipyard in 1980. Lech Valenza also drove around in a car that was papered over with the Polish constitution. He did not, he stuck out like a sore thumb. He just, he was a rebel, but he was also a change agent. And when it came time to actually negotiate, he was a great reformer. So he could wear all the hats. Okay, so coalitions. Let's see, how much, do I have till 1230? Um, yeah, your total time, but you've got about 16 minutes. Okay. 10 more minutes to talk. Okay, great. So coalitions. So what's the definition of a coalition? I'll just tell you. My definition is when two or more groups work together. But if you like academic definitions, there's one for you. <laughs> <laughs> it just means, this basically says they have a common purpose. It could be short term or long term. It could be local or national. It's when two or more groups work together. Okay. So here is my, yes, I know you're wondering who made this beautiful picture. It's me. So this is some PowerPoint art for you. And what I, you have here, does this have a little like pointer? Oh, yes, it does. So this big blue circle there is the, the mass of people who are mobilizable, movement. And these are organizations of different size within the movement. And if they don't form coalition, each of them has some members or groups they're close with, and they can sort of mobilize this many people. And if they start to work in coalition, they can mobilize that many people and work with that many people, have influence over that many people anyway. Not control them, but at least have influence. <laughs> so what do we see here? We see Tahrir Square in 2011, right? But let's, and we could say, we see a movement. We also see a coalition. This is an image put out by the BBC where they labeled different groups working together in Tahrir Square to provide different services. Right? If this coalition breaks down, what happens to the mobilization in Tahrir? Has problems. No one knows where to go to the bathroom, right? Uh, and other things. Where's the food? Where's the water? So within a movement, there's often a coalition, and that coalition's health is often very important to the movement's health. And then there's different types, formal or informal, a formal umbrella you know, group or an informal coalition. Vanguard and integrative is one that I think is important. A vanguard coalition is when I represent an organization that I think all of you should support me doing what I want to do. And sometimes you may decide it's a strategically good idea. For example, if I am a worker at a fast food restaurant or at a Walmart, and I'm saying we're going to strike at this Walmart and get our raises higher, you may all support me. And that would be a vanguard coalition. Everyone get behind me and let's do this. An integrative coalition is different. That's when you all say, wait a minute. We have issues, too, of low pay. Why don't we form? a coalition that integrates all of our interests together and push for actually the state legislature, the parliament, to do something like raise the minimum wage for everyone. And then insider and outsider coalitions. This relates to access. Who has insider access? Who has outsider access? Now, what are the benefits? 
What are the benefits? We'll just throw out a few things. Shared resources. Shared resources, right? Great. Mobilization of people. More people, absolutely. Yeah, print. Legitimacy, absolutely. You don't duplicate your duties. Great. You don't, yes, you can diversify your roles because you don't have to duplicate activities. Yeah, Jim. Efficiency, great. Thanks. Mina. Being protected. Pardon? Protected. Being, Being protected. There's safety in numbers, absolutely, and greater resources. If I'm going to do some really high risk actions, I might want to form a coalition with a lawyer's group, for example. Okay. So here are a few that you listed. Access to resources, human financial material, skills and expertise, access to networks and contacts. Um, I will give an example from the US Civil Rights Movement. And if Mary and Jim want to comment on it, I would just say wait till after, because uh, I only have a few minutes left anyway. But so the US Civil Rights Movement has been called a movement of movements. And there were coalitions that were important within that. And so I'll just point out a, you know, a few ma you know, major organizations that were important. So the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and the Urban League were older organizations that had institutional connections, more access to money, uh, legal resources. The Southern Christian Leadership Council had uh, a net great networks of churches, visibility, Reverend King as, as a spokesperson, the Congress of Racial Equality, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, do you recognize who's up there? <laughs> Were, played a rebel role, but also a change agent role. Um, and you know, you could probably find examples of all of these groups playing all the roles. And it wasn't always harmonious in that coalition, and I'm sure you can talk to Mary and Jim about that at some point, and they can tell you just how challenging it could be. But when they, when they harmonize, they achieve something that none of those groups by themselves could achieve. Legitimacy is very, very important. If a group is doing something by itself, people look at it and say, well, that's interesting, but they're pursuing their own self-interest. That's great that the fast food workers at one restaurant want to raise their wages, but that's their self-interest. Why should I support them? If they work in coalition, it's defined as public interest. Because then the question is, why are all these groups supporting them? There must be something bigger than just that one issue. So this is a picture of 1969 in the US uh, city of Seattle, where you had a boycott against grapes in California. This was a nationwide boycott against grapes as farm workers were trying to unionize. Farm workers were some of the lowest paid, uh, most discriminated against people in the United States, predominantly Mexican American and Filipino American, and they were striking and boycotting. And here you have a predominantly white, um, <laughs> participants doing a secondary boycott of a grocery store that sells grapes. So suddenly, if you're an onlooker, you're saying this isn't just an issue of Mexican American, Filipino Americans. There's more legitimacy here because you're, I mean, not necessarily, but you see what I'm saying. For the general public, they'll look and see more participation. Uh, OK, I won't comment on those other ones. Costs and risks. Let's get to that, and then I'll make one more point, and then we'll stop. What are the costs and risks? Huh? Dilution of the cause. So some people talk about the NGOization of their struggle, right? <laughs> oh, you know, suddenly we're getting money from these people, and I'm not willing to take as much risk now that I have a paycheck and all these issues, and pretty soon. Hijacking of the agenda. Hij yes, hijacking of the agenda. Yeah, what else? Scramble for power. Scramble for power, absolutely. So even if people start harmoniously, you know, all of us were part of a four coalition, but then Heba starts becoming pretty powerful in that coalition, and she wants a little more say, you know. But Jasper is, you know, he, you know, he, he said some statements that maybe the public, you know, didn't go so well with the public, so he's sort of losing influence in the coalition or whatever, and it can get very complicated that way when power dynamics change over time. Confusion within the ranks? Confusion within the ranks. The opposite of efficiency, right? When it's not working. Yeah. Being so busy with keeping the coalitionists uh, that they lose all the outreach. So Pardon? Instead, in, they, instead of increasing their base as every movement, as every organization gets in their own people, it ends up that all the leaders are sitting around and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And they think that they are great, 
<laughs> but uh, in the end, they end up that all the movement, uh, the, all the organizations lose contact to the people. Is that so? You end up with having <coughs> an empty coalition of big heads. Is there a story behind this? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I have a feeling. I think it's a very good point. So, so first is that the other thing is just there's time and energy involved in simply creating a coalition, right? I have to get to know you all, and then I have to get to know what you're good at, and then I have to trust you, and then I have to figure out how you work. It doesn't just happen. Hey, guys, we all agree human rights are a good idea, right? Right. So we all have a shared interest. That doesn't mean we're going to form a coalition. We have to know each other, trust each other, and really be able to organize. It takes time, a lot of time. And you know, some of the literature I've read says, really, it's a full-time job. Organizations say, we're in a coalition, but don't assign someone to maintain that and do the interpreta interpretation of different cultures. It doesn't work. Contamination of legitimacy, when people might go out and say things that are self-serving. Distraction or dilution from mission. This third one is sometimes also an effect of success. Because sometimes a movement starts becoming more powerful, and some groups really start making progress. And they'll say, oh, well, our needs got taken care of. We're not quite as motivated anymore. Or you know what? We're going to join a political party now. So sometimes success itself can be a great challenge to coalitions. OK. Factors that promote coalition. Right, so this is going to be my last point, and then I'll stop, and we can open it up. So there are lots of factors that promote coalition formation. I've listed three here. OK, shared ideology, objectives, or means, shared identities, shared organizational history. Hey, we, the, you know, we've all sort of worked in this field together. You know, my sister worked with you, and I got to know you then. And then all that contributes. But I think these three things, actually, are sort of the surface layer of something deeper. And that deeper thing, again, comes down to this personal social ties and trust. We tend to associate more, some of us, with people who have shared ideology, shared identities, shared organizational history, which leads to personal social ties and trust. But that, I, the literature I've read says that's really, really a critical element. And what we know about movements from the literature, again, is that friends are often the best recruiters. It's an indicator. Will you join movement activity? Well, how many people do you know and how close are you who are in that movement? It's the same with coalitions. I'm going to give you one example. So in 2002, there was a coalition formed in October called Win Without War. Okay? It was in response to the, the Iraq war buildup. Okay? And so the founders were five people. 24 members of that coalition, member organizations, were directly known by the founders. They'd either worked with them, been friends with them, or so forth. Six more were known by these 24. So there's one degree removed, there's two degrees removed. Okay? This represents, what is it, 70, 85% of the coalition came through social networks. And then there were six others that were either asked to join or came and asked to join. And the point here is not that this is a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing. It's just a thing. And something that when movements get back to analyzing themselves to think, are there groups that we just don't have social ties to? And we keep saying, well, they should really support us because, because don't they see that we're fighting for them? Or don't they see that if the social ties aren't there, it can be very difficult. And this is just basic human behavior. It's not a linear process. Well, it's not a linear intellectual process. It's a linear emotional process. Um, so I think that's very, very important to point out. Um, oh, boy. Um, <laughs> one other point I'll make, and then I really mean it. I'll stop. There are lots of things that contribute to coalition sustainability or having them fall apart. But one very important one is institutional context. So when there was a draft in the United States for the Vietnam War, suddenly you had groups of people and families from all over the country, from different groups, that all shared the common experience of being drafted or being afraid of being drafted. This brought together coalition opportunity because suddenly there was a shared identity. 
And so political and institutional context can do that. It can also separate it by creating laws that narrowly target different groups. So every group's got a sort of different experience and a different point th that they want to leverage. George Bush, the election of George Bush, created a lot of coalition activity on those who opposed him. Institutional context, threat, overcame a lot of, a lot of differences between people to oppose George Bush. Same thing happened when Obama was elected on the other side. And so elections can be these great rallying points because if you want to do something, there's pretty much one thing you got to do. So everyone can come together on that. At the same time, after the election or after transition, suddenly there's lots of opportunities again. So the coalition comes together when there's a core opportunity. But then if a movement, say, leave aside US politics for a second, is wins, suddenly all these opportunities spread out and the coalition can totally fracture. Now think about it from the other side. If you're talking about a government, in the beginning there's all these opportunities. As it, after it loses to a movement, it then has only one point of leverage to try to get back. So if this is a movement, it's channeling all its activity towards a change. And then after the change, if it succeeds, there's all these opportunities and it can disperse. For the government, again, it could be the opposite. They could feel they have lots of opportunities, so they're not, they're not terribly organized here. But then after they feel commonly threatened by a movement's victory, they can come together and try to counter things. So it's interesting to think about it from both sides. OK, I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. All right, let's start with Q&A. And just so you know, I'm trying to do balance on both sides of the room and gender balance. I really like the um, categorization of the four dimensions of social activism that you presented, and I didn't know about it. And I think it really applies to the movement in Spain that I'm active in, in Indignado. <coughs> but I think in some cases, the role of reformers, for example, it's not possible to pursue, and it's not because the activists don't want, but because the structural, institutional conditions of the country or the government is blocking those talents. For example, in the case of, of Spain, in the, with the housing rights movement, we were we tried to introduce a legislative proposal in the parliament to change mortgage laws so people wouldn't get evicted that easily. Mm -hmm. And we had to collect at least half a million firms, and we collected one million and a half. And we got the proposal in the parliament, and it was automatically blocked, not even from discussion, from the ruling party, because they have a majority. And then that kind of makes you think you cannot do reforms because the political or the institutional channels are, channels are completely blocked. And then you turn to the other roles and you don't kind of put that much emphasis in the reformer because it's not possible. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with you. And we've had, we've had an immigrant rights movement in the United States that has had s some inside access but only limited success with that you know, reformist element. But they've had some. But they've had some really heartbreaking setbacks where they've gotten lots of grassroots power and it still hasn't converted. Um, so I hear what you're saying and agree how challenging it is. Yeah. OK, uh, I wanted to talk about diversity within a coalition. Uh -huh. when, when, you, when you recommend or when you advise groups, how important is it for you or what's your, your perspective on this? Because Sometimes uh, I believe that coalitions must be uh, formed by very, very different actors mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, um, they, I mean, sometimes in developing countries it's very difficult to do uh, because uh, they are excluded or, they, or they're not friends of their friends, like you, like you said. How important is that from, from your point of view? Do, do you actually preach it? that they, they have to be very different from, from you in, in, in the beginning? I, th I mean, I, I don't, there's no, there's no formula, obviously. So different contexts will have different mm -hmm. issues. I think, um, let's look at Maché's example for a second, OK? About, remember he was talking about that political scientist, Timur Karan, who was talking about this threshold of taking action? And so, the threshold for revolutionary action, if you want to call it that. Not many people have a really low threshold, okay? 
So in the beginning, you may just sort of have who's available because who's willing to take action when, the, when it looks like the other side has all the advantages? Who's willing to do that? And so you may not be able to get a very diverse group. You may only be able to mobilize the population that is the most affected by the grievance, who feels that they're suffering and that if they're going to keep suffering, they, they should suffer because they're fighting for their rights instead of suffering because they're not. So you may not have a choice in the beginning. But if, if you're a planner and you know that in the long term, your objective will require you to have a much bigger grassroots base. That's going to affect how you strategize. It's going to affect your movement culture. And it's certainly going to affect the way you talk about what you do. It's, it can be easy sometimes to rally people by a narrow vision about them that sometimes can be very alienating to other people. Because you for, you, you, the group identity gets reinforced by like all this thing about this is who we are, this is who we're not. But if you know you need a much broader coalition later, that language you will make thinking about all these different groups and what they'll hear. And also what the authorities will say about your movement. You'll also probably begin talking to these other diverse groups much earlier on, even if they're not part of, part of initial actions that a movement takes. Is that? It helps? OK. Well, uh, well, basically, I have some, uh, some questions. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of questions, but yeah. I'll try to like, uh, be short as I can. So if there's any kind of uh, different definition between what you can say, classic definition for movement and coalition and post social media definition, because I believe it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really different because I believe now you can have a, a, a really huge movement over a Facebook uh, page or like something like that. And actually, we had that in Egypt. Like one of the biggest movements was uh, doing uh, doing a lot of work, and during the revolution, was a Facebook uh, just a Facebook uh, page, and there's no structure. And you you're talking about the Khalid Said. Khalid Said. Yeah. So I believe there's some kind of different uh, definitions, like comparing. Uh, the civil rights movement uh, in America and what's happening now. I believe there's, it's not just like how you could do structure movement by doing that and that. It could be more creative and different. And that's the first one. The second question is related was how movements and coalitions could be different in democratic regimes than undemocratic uh, mm -hmm. regimes. Because I have that such a feeling it's not that effective in democratic country. Uh, because there's already there's there's a democracy people vote for people they want to represent and so it's not that uh, useful I, I believe mm -hmm. so uh, what's the difference between having a movement and coalition and like undemocratic regime and the, the, the other example that's a great question I mean your first point I take more as a comment and I don't really have a response to it um, I think social I, I guess I just say I think social media can play an important role as a tool but, but yeah, it, it can play an important role as a tool, especially in places where that is the freest political space that there is. Um, I think, so it's interesting. A lot of the theory that I'm giving you it was developed in democratic contexts. Um, the four roles were developed in a democratic context by a democratic, you know, by someone being an activist in the US. Um, I, I have increasingly come to believe that, that this stuff is equally relevant to both contexts. Um, but I, I, uh, I'm not, I'm very open to hearing differences that people hear. Um, but what I have seen in my conversations with activists is that they both struggle with similar things, at least in the terms of the psychology of coalitions and coordinating those roles. Yeah. I guess one challenge in the non-democratic context is not having formal organizations. And that is a real difference because they can't be registered and they're, the minute they're registered, they're persecuted. And so that is a real difference. coalition is very necessary because uh, I think that um, when it's we have a collective um, ideas put together then it, it kind of endorses some form of legitimacy and then we know that okay that, that there's a problem but then if we, um, the various entities 
have diverse interests, then it's, there's, I think that it poses kind of challenge um, in terms of prioritizing which of them needs to be done. Because in the end, for example, if one group says that, okay, my position I think it's quite critical and that we need to look at this, and then the other one says so, now which one do we tackle first? Mm -hmm. And if we tackle party A instead of B, I also feel that they can, they can think that, okay, but they don't really care about us and that we need to withdraw our support from the whole system. And that fills the coalition. So at what point do you necessarily have to get um, a similar ideas? For example, we're all fighting for accommodation issues and that we can put our, ourselves together because it's still the same. Or even though we have different issues, we can still put together and then prioritize them in a different way such that no one is embittered in the end and then we can right. still work towards the same thing. So, um, so it's not just what a movement's doing, which is very important, and what issues it's focused on, which is very important. It's also the public perception of why it's doing it. And so you can get different campaigns, which we'll talk about next, different phases of a movement, focusing on different issues. For example, in South Africa, during the 1980s, there was a coalition of over 400 civic groups that fought for everything from clean water to in their township to integration of facilities and everything else, local demands. But it was understood that those local demands were all tied to a broader, in you know, US terms we say, meta-narrative. This narrative that all of this was actually building towards the fact that we needed system change. And so it was OK in that context to say, if that's the local issue for you, and that's the local issue for you, and that's the local issue for you, that's fine. But let's all have the same narrative about why we're doing it. So then it all builds the nonviolent power towards the same direction. And everyone watching has a sense, ah, we see the connection between what's happening in this city and that city. They're our allies. Then in another sense, there's, there are phases where it's very important for a movement to concentrate its strength on an achievable objective. Because if you, if you try too many things at once, you could fail at all of them, right? So there's no, again, there's no formula about which option you choose. I think it has to do a lot with analysis of the capacity of the movement. Can it simultaneously pursue two objectives at once? And the analysis of the adversary and the environment. What are the political opportunities? How can we concentrate our strengths against their weaknesses and win? With the full knowledge, again, that winning on the local issue may get clean water. It may get better public services. But sometimes the bigger impact, again, will be the psychological impact in people's minds that nonviolent power worked once so it could work again. And if People come to it from that perspective and have the trust. This is where the trust comes in. I can see now that it's more important to let this group lead with their issue because it's more achievable. And I trust that they will, at a later point, also be able to push for mine. So it's, it's but there's no formula, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're hitting on a very important issue. And there's this challenge with mobilization, right? Because say, for example, I'm representing people of a certain socioeconomic class or people of a certain religious group or ethnicity. I have to have, I have to be able to communicate in a way that shows these people that I understand them and that I'm one of them and that I've listened to them. And that can be perceived sometimes as nationalism which then can be looked at by the other side, which we may need as allies, as alienating. 
increasing social distance. So I need to find a way to mobilize my group, call on their identity at the same time that I'm trying to bridge social distance. And social distance isn't just racial, though that's obviously a huge source of it, or religious. It can even be socioeconomic class, gender, or even profession. Those police are completely not like us, you know, or those, you know, whoever. So there's lots of reasons. People are great at finding reasons why we're all different, right? We're, we're really good at that. And, and that's why language isn't something that you really fool around with. I mean, language is something that is extremely carefully weighed, if possible. Again, this is theory. In practice, is it possible to do this all the time? No. But building this set of values and rhetoric, and one of the things that you'll see a lot that movements do, is they'll start with a shared value as the anchor for what they're doing. Because there are values that are shared across lots of different groups. And if the, it starts in those values, if it starts, starts in finding shared history, if it starts in finding shared religious ideas or patriotic ideas or whatever people are comfortable with as the anchor and then moving. And again, this is why when we look at Dr. King's speeches, we see, uh, I mean, so many reasons, not just this. We can see the way he uses symbols and values that people that are widely shared in the American public at that time as the turning point for the actions and, and issues that he was fighting for. But it's challenging, this bridging social distance at the same time that you're asserting there's something wrong and it's our group that's affected. When we were talking about coalition, I perceive it too, you are talking very much in a structural sense. And uh, my question is like, uh, when you talk about the analysis, the second thing that when you talk about the analysis, when so many coalitions are working, Together. So then how is it, is it possible to do an overall analysis of the situation? And the third one is that how to uh, create a synchronization, a perfect synchronization. So th these are three main things. Mm -hmm. So th I'll, I'll answer them in reverse order. So the synchronization we'll talk to more about. We've got, you've got someone much better than me to talk about this. You've got Yvonne in the next session who has lived it. So uh, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say about. You know, I'm going to talk next session about some ways to think about strategy and what good strategy might look like. And Yvonne is going to talk about the on the ground process. Um, so that should be good. What was your other question? The first one oh, structuralist. Am I falling into this? Wait, didn't Mache just say structural conditions aren't the most important thing? And here I come being, well, look at these factors, right? <laughs> OK, let me give you a counter example, OK? Because I come prepared. I never come with a PowerPoint presentation that's less than 100 slides, <laughs> OK? That is good strategic planning. You think of, you never make assumptions about your audience. You always think they could ask you 10 different things. You'd be ready. OK, so the United Democratic Front, OK? The 1980s in South Africa. And is Howard Barrell here? OK, well, you, we're in for a treat because Howard Barrell was part of the United Democratic Front and part of the ANC, and we'll speak about this uh, in the next few days. But the United Democratic Front was a coalition, I think I said 400 earlier, it's actually 700 community level groups, right? Nonviolently fighting against apartheid in the 80s. And they form a coalition with the ANC, which has not abandoned violence as a way to achieve, um, to achieve liberation for South Africa, okay? And they have lots of different challenges, hold up. Number one, the South African uh, government at that point passed this policy called the Tricameral Parliament. Okay, has anyone heard of this before? This was an attempt to divide the anti-apartheid movement. Okay, so if you were, they use the term colored, a person of mixed race, you could have your own parliament. It would be much less powerful than the white parliament, but you could have some quote unquote official parliament. And then if you were a person of South Asian or Indian descent, you could have some seats there too. And if you were a black South African, you were part of the blo black local authorities that would have some say over townships. So this is an attempt by a regime to create an institutional context to channel protest activity, channel political activity so that it divides people. So there's one structure that's against this coalition happening, okay? There's another. One's nonviolent, the other has not, the ANC has not said that it's not violent. In fact, it still uses violent imagery and, and sometimes violent attacks. So there's another, different ideology about means, okay? There's another. Um, let's see, the UDF, um, hold up, what was it? 
Right. They were calling, the ANC was calling for sanctions from South African government. Do you think South African trade unions all wanted sanctions? No. They still joined. So here you have another you know, external factor that was creating a problem. You even had arguments about what kind of unity should be called for. Is it racial unity? Is it post-racial unity? Is it non-racial unity? What kind of unity? You had fights about what colors the posters should be in between the ANC and the UDF. Okay? So there are all kinds of different reasons in the environment why, they should, why this shouldn't have worked. But it did. But it did. And I would argue that part of why this coalition was able to come together, even in spite of all these factors, oh, of course, and then racial factors, black and white, was because of a shared common threat and a shared common opportunity. And when there's a sense of common shared threat and common opportunity, it can get people to bury their differences or at least talk about them in a way that's not publicly divisive. I think in the, almost in every country, a part of the analysis for looking at your situation is to recognize that violence has been very ineffective creating better communities. Violence has been very effective in maintaining the status quo, period. So in many situations, I think people have to make a decided decision. Palestine is one of those, in my, in my estimation. Palestinians want to push for two states, which they ought to be doing. They have to swear off violence. They have to recognize how much harm it's done. For 80 years, since 1947, it has produced no justice for Palestinians. So how long do you hang on to styles of things that are not working before you decide maybe we need a radical intellectual, spiritual, moral, political decision and find a different direction? Palestinian scene cannot beat the fifth most effective military machine in the world, Israel, and it cannot match the economic or the military machine or technological machine of the United States. That's one instance in the world where the romantic talk about violence is not permitting a people to coalesce and to develop some strategies that can make a change on their behalf. And that romantic knowledge about violence simply does not do an effective job of looking at the status quo and how well it's being defended by the very many different mechanisms of violence. Thank you. Um, I wasn't actually going to say that uh, I agree on a side note with uh, the idea of that violence has actually not helped the Palestinian cause. Um, but sadly, nonviolent resistance has been occurring in Palestine, but nobody wants to admit it or recognize it outside of these communities, especially the media, um, that this is occurring because the narrative is that Palestinians are violent. So you don't want to see this group that's supposed to be violent using nonviolent tactics so that it's not being exposed. And I've seen this firsthand with media who's covering it and saying, I'm not going to profit off that photo of nonviolence, but as soon as that boy picks up a rock, one stone is media attention because here we get to portray the violent perpetrators that Palestinians are supposed to be. Side note though. Um, for me, in my, in my activism here in the US, um, I've been part of a coalition, and it was my first and last experience. <laughs> um, and, and this was actually in 2006 in uh, San Francisco Bay Area, for anyone who doesn't know, it's the activist hub of the US, and everyone has a cause. Um, and everyone likes to talk a lot about their cause. Um, and in 2006, when Israel uh, was bombing Lebanon, uh, a group of activists, in response, we reacted to this, well, we're very far away, how much can we do? We are gonna take to the streets. And there, a coalition was created, and it was very spontaneous. We had uh, you know, community space, we all gathered, it was wonderful. Um, everyone had their own thing. You like to write 
gov to the government, do that. I'm not gonna do that. I'm an artist. We're gonna be take to the streets with art. It was wonderful for about two weeks. Yeah. Um, and then within that time, you know, these smaller groups were really thriving within their groups. But the problem was that we had, and I think this is what I've seen in every movement that I've ever witnessed or been a part of, you have individuals with privilege imposing their privilege within this group, uh, whether it's identity privilege, class privilege, uh, educational privilege, and their imposition of their privilege actually um, forces other people out of that group, especially people who we should be listening to. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're talking about Lebanon and, and the siege, we should really have Lebanese people in the forefront, not the Jewish American who is well-educated and well-read on, on mm -hmm. the Middle East, um, as well as these individuals can speak. They're taking up this space, and, and really it's, it's a problematic for the cause. And I find that privilege is an overlying issue in most movements because we cannot get rid of our privilege, myself included. I have a lot of privilege. But I think it's my responsibility as an activist to not impose that privilege and to use that privilege rather than abuse that privilege and even in the U.S. occupied movement. They didn't even attempt to create a coalition. It was a very middle, middle class, white, uh, educated community who's, we are against the 1%, but we're also oppressing the low, low income communities that we exist within and not including them into this cause, which could have been very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that this is, for me, a very central part of activism in general that we really need to tackle as uh, uh, informed people. Yeah, I Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that contribution. Okay, okay. Um, I just want to comment because I think that any effective and successful movement should have very good risk analysis and should be very clear with its members about risk if they should face in any uh, protest. Because if I'm a new member in any movement and they would organize a protest or a march and I ask them, do, will, I fi will I face any risks? And they said no, because they just need a huge number of people and they get arrested. They will lose their reputation and their credibility. Mm -hmm. Not just for me, but for the other people. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So, uh, I will tell you about our experience of coalition uh, last year. So after three days of protest, that the importance of the, of the leadership. So this is one of the questions that I will come to, that, that how to differentiate and distinguish between the leadership and the, and the coalition. So uh, we managed and succeed that to, to, to formulate a coalition from the all youth uh, movement and the traditional parties and informal labor unions. Because in Sudan, the government that you know cancel all uh, labor unions in order to avoid any such organized uh, movement or uh, protest. So um, we announced on the world media that the formulation of this coalition. But unfortunately, after two days, it has collapsed. Why? Because the traditional parties, you know, start thinking about who will take the leadership of this. And you know, next week we will go to the, to the palace. And you know, and we were focusing on how to organize the people in the, in the street. <laughs> so unfortunately it was uh, a big failure. And it was one of the reasons that the protests were not continuous. Can so I, yeah. my question, or my questions that the, the difference between the leadership or if the coalition is, you know, uh, is an answer for the leadership in a such situation. And the second thing is the, the, the formulation and the content of the coalition itself. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think, so it's funny, what you're saying made me think a little bit of the Occupy movement in the U.S. where there was, I mean, I take your point, Aisha, as well, that there was a lot of not reaching out that even happened in that movement. But there was also, uh, even among those who were there, there was, there, was a, there was a lack of planning ahead of time about what to do once they got there. So that led to all kinds of conflicts about how do we even make decisions, let alone what do we decide to do, right? And so there's, this gets to this question of how much strategy do you plan and sort of 
and decide this is who we are, this is what we do before you mobilize so that anyone who joins after that it already is like, if you join us, you're coming to our program and this is what it is. And how much of that do you let sort of change and evolve as a movement grows? You, I don't know if this is relevant, but part of what I heard you saying is that when people join the coalition, maybe there wasn't, maybe there could have been or should have been more strategy and principles and clear goals set before the coalition was built so that it couldn't split on that issue after it was built. Um, it's just one thought, and we call that front loading the strategy. How much of your strategy do you front load? How much of your movement culture do you try to really get coalition partners to agree to? This is how we do things here. These are our operating principles. If you don't if you, if you can't abide by them, you can't be part of a coalition. Um, so I, it, I guess I'm sort of answering your question with questions, but it's something that we'll talk more about next session and the following sessions as well. Because yeah. again, it's not perfect for any one thing. I can tell you examples. There's an example of um, environmental groups and labor groups in the United States have a history sometimes of not getting along well. There could be a chemical that workers are using that's making them sick, and that's also destroying the environment. So you'd think they have a common reason to come together, right? But if the environmentalists get too far ahead and don't talk to the labor groups and start making big comments about this chemical needs to be banned, and the labor groups don't talk to the environmentalists and make their own comments, they've already gotten too far ahead of themselves, and it's hard to walk back and say, oh, we should actually be in coalition. So there are cases where you don't want to front load your strategy so much and then say, OK, we've defined who we are, now come join us because it can get you into trouble. And then there are cases where you really need to do that so you make sure that your coalition is solid and anyone who joins knows what they're joining. So it can be, go both ways. Okay, we're gonna take two last comments questions for people who had their hands raised and, and we're really respectful of everybody's questions and there's gonna be lots of opportunities to discuss. It's gonna be Emmanuel and then Bobo. Thank you. I just want to come back to uh, the four rules of social activism. We were saying, we were, talk, we were talking about citizen, the driver, change agents, and the farmers. If I reorder them and I put them in the citizen change agent reformers and rebel, when when do we stop being the rebel? In 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 your analysis and study of all these, you you cited great examples, Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember also reading about Ma Nelson Mandela in South Africa being quoted at one point as being a rebel. In in in, in your research, where did you see them stop being the rebel? Mm. Because I think yeah. there's a fine line between just stopping mm -hmm. right there, and if you don't stop, the thing blows up. There are always going to be a need for rebels, and I, I, I would love, you know, maybe um, right before next session or something, I can get Moyers. He actually charts over eight stages here's where the rebel is, and here's where the, if you subscribe to his theory. But obviously, in the beginning, when no one's talking about something, the rebel gets it on the agenda. But there's always the risk. One thing about commitment and people understanding why they're in a cause is that it, it, anyone, me, everyone constantly needs to be reminded. I can join an organization and be super motivated and then a month later I'm so caught up in little things that I don't know what I'm doing anymore and I've lost my motivation. You look at sports teams, people are like, oh, they're not playing well, they're not motivated. It constantly is something that people need. And rebels, if they play their role effectively, can be the people that dramatize that again and again and again, and can play a very important role throughout a movement. And the other thing, but however, if there is a time where reformers become more important, or where the rebels need to take back so that the citizens can say, we're going to define what this issue is to us now, if the rebels can step back, that's very constructive. If there's big fights in the middle of the movement, it's not. So it depends. And movements have huge setbacks, and those setbacks, again, can sometimes call for more inspiration. One of the things that Moyer says in his theory, which I love it, is stage five, where the movement's making a lot of progress, but the hardcore people who want to change to come, who are often rebels, who want to change to come quickly, decide that the movement has failed. And so even when you're winning, if you don't have a full sense of the model and timeline, which could be years, you could be winning and then think you're losing because you haven't achieved success yet. But maybe your idea of what success would look like or how long it would take needs to be changed instead of you deciding you lost. Um, so anyway, that gets a little further from your question, but it's an interesting thought. I can't yep. take all of them, sorry. I can ask a question. Uh, I put interested in, in the uh, situation that 
application of the um, uh, movement base. Because uh, especially uh, just like the case in Hong Kong and, and in Taiwan, because we uh, nowadays the social movement we all rely on social media. So that uh, uh, that means uh, even though we have a consensus among the, the organization, we have a consensus on decision making or, or leadership or share ideas, uh, share objectives, uh, etc. But uh, the the general public who call uh, to who, who follow or, or support the movement and then they they come and join the movement, maybe they have not such uh, the, the common the common uh, ground or, or uh, they they do not share the, the same objective. Um, for example, maybe maybe the coalition the objective is the movement objective is to uh, stop uh, false emission, but the prob uh, but the general public come to join the movement. Maybe their focus is to uh, uh, fight against the government. Uh, so that uh, uh, if the, the they, they form an other coalition, uh, if they have uh, uh, so and, and even challenge the original coalition. So that, what can we do? It's a good question. It's tough to answer that question without a specific case. It's tough to answer it uh, in the abstract or theoretical realm. But I'd be happy to talk more if there's like a, a particular case. Um, because the kind of thing you're talking about happens all the time. But I just think with different cases, it's, um, you know, there are different opportunities and, and, and potentials with uh, it. I'm not so sure where it's common, especially in the situation if we rely on social media. Oh, you're talking about how social media does that? how it contributes to that problem. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. Um, it seems to me that if, uh, just sort of a broad comment, if a movement is relying mostly on social media as, as sort of a very important organizing platform, it's a very risky organizing platform to rely on over the long term. And so there's, you know, there's no substitute for face-to-face -face contact and for localizing an, issue, localizing an issue. That doesn't mean that social media is not important. It just means that if you depend on social media, it is very easy for even a small group of people with a little bit of finances to make a really big thing on social media because they made a viral video and suddenly everyone's talking about it. So if that's, if that's your main battlefield, there are huge risks with that. But if you have the grassroots base, a really good message that resonates with that base, Social media is going to be a way of getting that message out, but it's not going to be the way you organize so much, necessarily. Um, so just one thought about that. OK. All right, well, let's thank you very much, Harry. Sure.